recording now. So thank you for being part of the philosophy class, Lisa Romano. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, good. He's responding. Yeah, excellent. Um, so thank you for being part of this exchange and this presentation. And uh, I just want to remind the philosophy students that I've made uh, the book uh, by Lisa Romano that I edited. It's this one, the first version of it, so to speak. Uh, it's an excellent book. It just needed a little tweaking in terms of edit, in terms of punctuation and a few minor things. And it's kind of done now. So, and I'm also interested in writing a preface so that uh, the work that Lisa, had, which is really uh, incredible work, I think. Um, she's not the only one, but I think she's the only one that is doing it this way. And it combines the right descriptions of things and the right prescriptions um, of how to approach a wounded, um, uh, a wounded individual, the, the, the wounded individual that needs assistance, or the, and and how to grow from from the 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 trauma that that people have experienced in their lives. So thank you so much for being here with us, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. For and um, I just was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your background as a, um, you know, as someone who grew up in, in, in New York, near New York, and then who went to school, and then you had a difficult time figuring out what path you would take in life, and then you, you did it, and you did it brilliantly. Well, I don't know what I did. I don't, I really, what I did was just follow, follow my bliss. I had no plan. You had no plan. I had no plan. This is completely just me aligning myself with what felt right, which I talk about in Quantum Tools, and me learning to figure out how I feel, paying attention to what felt right, what felt wrong, and learning to ebb in the direction of what felt like flow, and away from people and ideas and experiences that felt like constriction. Um, it's just lining up, lining up, lining up, line, lining up. And I think we're supposed to do that naturally, but I think that childhood experiences, societal influences, familial norms, expectations of mothers and fathers, childhood experiences, being bullied and all that crap, you know, not feeling good enough. Um, you know, I think children that come from other countries and, and land in America might not feel good enough, you know? Um, feeling like, you know, you just can't measure up, that type of thing, that takes you out of the flow. So now you're trying to be something that you're not, hoping that that's the answer, and all you really have to do is be who you are. Um, in terms of my background, I grew up in a dysfunctional home, although everything looked perfect. I couldn't point to anything. There was no alcoholism, there was no domestic violence, but it felt wrong. My mother was very explosive. My mother was very critical. My father was uh, very rageful. Um, mm -hmm. If he didn't get his way, there was hell to pay. We were hit with the belt. Um, really? Yeah, we were hit with the belt and we, there were welts that were left on us. Um, didn't happen often, but when it did, it was traumatic. Um, my mother, if she got angry, anything that she could grab a hold of, a hold of she'd hit you with it. Um, she was very unpredictable in her moods, but it was very obvious that she, she monitored her moods around my dad. So it was a very bizarre experience to see her raging one minute and then ha have her hear my father's car pull up and stop. Hmm. And we were all supposed to freeze. So she taught us to fear him, to stuff our emotions, and that being authentic was not acceptable. Right. For some reason, whoever the dictator in the house, that's who you had to be afraid of. You could not tell your truth in front of him. Um, my father would um, give you praise if you smiled. So you got my father's approval if you smiled. You got my father's approval if when he said, you should do this, you said, yes, you're right. You got his approval if you agreed with him. You, he, you were disapproved of any time you disagreed with him. Anytime. Um, and my mother was just very highly critical, but I couldn't point to any of that. That was just my mom and my dad. And I just, I could never get their approval. So I ultimately thought it was me and went to school and I got bullied in school terribly to the point of almost committing suicide. Um, 
came out of that experience, finally ended up in high school. I didn't want to know anybody. I just wanted, I saw myself as a cat lady in Manhattan. I'm not even kidding. I said, relationships are too difficult. There's something wrong with me. Everything is painful. Every interaction is painful. I just want to live alone by myself with a few cats in Manhattan. That's what I want to do. Um, so uh, he just said he has a friend who lives in a similar situa uh, situation as you did. Yeah, it's not fun. Um, and so I just really believe that that's the way I was going to live my life and uh, ultimately found a group of girlfriends that are still my friends today, which saved my life. And uh, then I got married at 21 and it, would, it was a very dysfunctional marriage and very codependent. And my body was break. Yep, that's my first book. Yep. And that's it. My body. I read it. It's it's a very good book. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, 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 to be honest with you, there was one thing that I really enjoyed, which was when you started to defend your brother from being yeah. bullied by another person, and sort of you came into your own, having the courage to tell somebody, "Buddy, get off this." Yeah, yeah it was really interesting that even though I was so bullied, I I didn't like seeing other people be bullied. I just couldn't handle it. And even though my brother and I had a very difficult relationship, I knew why he and I didn't get along. I was smart enough at seven to know you're comparing him to me and you're ruining my relationship with him. And he hates me because of what you're doing. Because my parents would, my father would compare him to me. Like, mm -hmm. do your work like your sister. You're not as smart as your sister. Look at your penmanship, this poor kid. And my father would hit him in the back of the head while we're doing homework. Oh, and I would, oh, yeah. I would so cry funny. for him. And, but he hated me. He took it out on me. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And then my mother, when we got older, my mother would triangulate him against me. That was her little bully buddy. And mm -hmm. so the two of them. But I understood what was going on. I just had this knowing, like, they're ruining my relationship with him, you know? And it's really not his fault. And that's why when I saw boys my age bullying my brother. I was just like, oh no, oh no, you're not gonna bully him. Because I knew my father bullied him. Even though we didn't get along, I wasn't gonna let someone do that to my brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know. Just, and, to, to, I mean, it, to me, it's, it, it, the, the way in which you, you couch it, the way it's, it's, it's explained and, and, and it comes into a narrative that is uh, engrossing. It's just fascinating little narrative. But also, it, it sort of makes me aware or made me aware of the fact that you were uh, not only at the same time as you were going through your own personal struggles, the fact that you helped him, helped you mm -hmm. figure out who you were and that you could actually have a path forward in, 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 in helping out others after you figure out even more things about yourself. My yeah, I just, I, I don't know if. All I knew when I when I ultimately decided I wasn't going to kill myself, believe it or not, that's where I really right. That that's in the book too. Yes, that's where I found some sliver of um, I can't be bad. You know, I grew yeah. up until the age of twelve. You know, the kids in my grade were so mean to me, and I thought I must be so worthless of a person. I must have no worth. You know, and the teachers acted like they didn't see it. One teacher said, "Oh, he hits you because he likes you." I'm like. <laughs> what planet do you live on? Like, he hates me. Like, you know, what's wrong with you? He doesn't like me, you know? So it just felt like just abandonment of wherever, wherever I went, it was just constantly aban abandonment. So it just, it made me feel worthless. Like, why am I here? Like, why am I here? Right, you know? right. um, and when I ultimately decided not to kill myself, um, I, came, I came to the conclusion that, you know, if I kill myself, I'm going to hurt my mother. She's going to feel responsible. I'm going to hurt my dad. You know, his mother committed suicide. I can't do that to him. Who's going to protect my brother? Who's going to protect my sister? Because if I kill myself, it was really go running through the consequences of actually killing myself, like literally seeing the consequences. Right, right. Okay, so when your brother and sister go back to school, they're going to say, oh, your sister was the crazy one. Right? Yeah, yeah, Who's yeah, going to protect right. them? Right. And so right. thinking I'm going to go to school tomorrow, even though I was so humiliated today and I want to die. That's how much it hurts. I'm going to go to school today because I love you and you're never going to know how much I love you. 
you're never going to know that there was a choice for me to end my life mm -hmm. and end all this suffering. And I didn't choose it because I loved you. And you're never going to know it. And even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. But I'm going to go to school tomorrow. I'm going to do it because I can't hurt you that way. And that I sat there on my mother's bedroom floor and I thought, I can't be that bad. Right, 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 right. I, there's got to be something salvageable in here. Right, right. And I am willing to go to school and face these kids, even though I, I was so humiliated today and it's going to be all on tomorrow. I can't be that bad. And that helped me hold on to just help me hold on for another day. And I committed, I committed myself to that day that I will never, ever, ever, ever think about killing myself again, ever. And I never did. Mm -hmm. I never did. Thank and so you. that's really, you know, that's what, there was a root. At 12 years old, was a 12, when I was 12, a lot of weird things happened in my life, you know, mm -hmm. where just made me feel connected to something bigger than my fucked up family. There was something, something was bigger than what I was experiencing. You know, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't name it. I, I write in the book. I know it sounds crazy. Anthony always says, my husband, don't tell too many that people at story. I go, it's in my book. What do you mean? <laughs> it's done. It's, it's done. already done. It's in my book. But it's I heard, I it's, heard a good, it's a very good book. I, I really enjoyed reading it. The tipping yeah. point on page 107. It was the first day of eighth grade. Is this what you're talking about just now? <laughs> so bad. Yeah, that was the, that was the day where I was, you know, like, oh my God. Like, because what happened, just a brief story, what happened was I had no friends. And then in seventh grade, was it seventh grade? Yeah, it was seventh grade. Yeah, yeah. This girl started. Eighth to grade, this one says. First would be eighth grade. Right. But what happened was it was the grade before that okay. I befriended gotcha. this girl, Jill. And I told her I couldn't wait to tell her all my secrets. I thought, finally, I have someone I can share and I could connect to. It just felt so delicious and so amazing. It felt loving and it felt, you see me? It felt it felt vulnerable and it felt so good. It felt like I was connecting to someone because my mother had always shamed me. So mm -hmm. this felt so beautiful and so expansive and it was just so hopeful. And I just bleh, told her everything, you know, innocently. And then turns out that she was a thief. She was a kleptomaniac. Her entire her sisters, her cousin, they all went into the Woolworths at the time. Yeah, you describe it too. And I couldn't, I was like, oh boy. And we were making confirmation that year. And I just felt so like, I can't do this. Like this is, and she threatened me. She said, if you don't go in there, if you don't steal that thing from me, I'll never talk to you again. And, you know, this is another turning point in my life at 12. I decided not to steal what she wanted me to steal. And I said, I can't do that. Because I felt like I'm honoring this higher power that is, I'm a part of, I can't really explain it, but um, right. I can't ignore that this is not a moral, this is immoral, this is not an ethical, right, right. I can't ignore it. And so even though I was so lonely, I, I chose to abandon this relationship and I knew she was going to abandon me, but I didn't know how bad. Yeah. And I just walked away and said, I can't keep disowning this thing, this person mm. to me that says that's wrong. And then that the, the year, the year went on, you know, I ignored her and she ignored me and I could handle that. But that summer she turned into a freaking bombshell. I mean, an absolute gorgeous bombshell, like Brooke Shields, like beautiful. I couldn't believe what summer was. Really? Good All of a sudden, boom. Exactly. It was the summer was good to her. And I was still a scrawny, hairy arm, little flat chested little girl <laughs> returning to eighth grade. And here this bombshell walks into the eighth grade schoolyard holding hands with the boy that I told her that I loved. Oh, yeah. So she, she, she found the boy. <laughs> she went, oh, yeah? You're, gonna not, you're not going to do what I want you to do? Oh, you love him? I'm going to go get him. Yeah. So let's talk about narcissistic behavior. Oh, right? yeah. Even at, in seventh grade. Um, and she told him everything. Oh, she did tell him everything, right. She told him everything, and my, my life really flashed before my eyes because I, could, I would never have done that to anyone. Right. So it wasn't in my scope to think. Right. It never crossed my mind that she was going to... That anybody could do that, and her in particular. 
but that's exactly what she wanted to do in order to humiliate you and own yeah. you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's what happened. So she told them everything in that day, um, or shortly thereafter, I can't remember if it was the exact day, but shortly, whatever, he ended up coming to the doorway of the classroom and he called me every foul name in the book. Really, yes. And okay. so it felt like, you know, I had this private community in my head that no one knew about, that I would escape to in my writing. And it was all mine, you know, because my house was so toxic. So when I wrote and I fantasized, nobody was there. And then I had the, the uh, audacity to share those thoughts with someone, this girl. And I trusted her. And then when she took these thoughts and she shared them with this boy, she violated me. She violated completely. I felt raped. My psyche felt yes. And not only did he know, now the whole eighth grade knew. Yes, now, now they all knew. They'd outed you and they did, you know, violated your privacy and your trust finished. No, no felt trust. Like there was no safe place in my home. I wasn't safe at school. And I now, I didn't feel safe in my mind. So that's what I said. The thought that struck me was, I'll just go home and I'll kill myself and then all this pain will go away. That's the only way I got through school that day. It anesthetized me. I didn't feel the pain. Don't worry, Lisa, you're gonna go home. You're gonna kill yourself. You don't have to feel this way anymore. Don't worry about it. I floated home that day. It literally was anesthesia. I don't have to feel this way anymore. I'll be dead. It's the only way I got through the day. Wow. When I got to actually killing myself, and then I, the, what saved me was I looked at myself in the mirror, and I had my Catholic school uniform on, and I was just weeping. And that, for a split second, that's why I talk about in my program and in my book, the power of feeling seen. Because for a split second, I saw me. I saw the little girl inside of me that was in so much pain and everybody discarded. For a split second, I was like, oh my God, you're in pain, you matter. And that was enough to say, I heard a voice say, put the gun down, one day you'll show them. And it was an audible voice. I know it sounds crazy, but I literally looked around the room. That's how loud it was. And it was enough for me to say, just that second to like, imagine myself in a coffin and my, and I, I saw my family there and I just, who's going to take care of them? And all I'm doing is get bringing them more pain. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided I can't kill myself. You know, I just can't do that. And then it was like just sitting there on the floor of my mother's bedroom thinking, I can't be bad. My mother's wrong. Like there has to be something that is salvageable within me if I'm not following through with killing myself because I want to die. You know, mm-hmm. I don't want to go to school tomorrow. I don't want to be, I realized ultimately that I didn't want to die. I wanted love and I wanted right. to be loved, but there was right. nowhere in my life that, that it was accessible to me. So my life was so dark. So I didn't want to die. I just wanted the pain to stop. Right. Right, yeah, right. So those are very two important um, events that occurred in my life when I was 12 that really made me believe that there's something beyond, you know, who we think we are. And again, we talked about in the other class that who we think we are very oftentimes is corrupt. Right, what we think we are is oftentimes corrupt. Because who we think we are is a product of who other people have impressed us to believe that we are. My mother impressed me to believe that I was bad and I was no good. So if you would have asked me at 12, Lisa, who are you? I might have said, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a girl and I like to draw and I like to write, but who I thought I was was stained and broken and inval- invalid and unworthy and bad, literally bad. That's really what I felt. That's really how you felt. That's really how I felt. I wouldn't have told you that because I was trained to worry what you think. So right. I want you to think well of me. I'd want you to think that I thought well of me because I know that that was the appropriate answer. Right. And I, I wouldn't have had the, the, I didn't feel valid enough to say I feel unworthy because everyone in my life told me I didn't have, I didn't have a right to feel that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Look how clean your house is, Lisa. I go to work every day, Lisa. You eat three meals a day, Lisa. What are you crying about, Lisa? I'm not going to tell you I'm unhappy. No way. 
Right. No right. way. So that's why I think it's important that if we're going to ask people, who do you think you are? I think a more important question or a more helpful question would be who right here, right now, based on your environment and what you grew up with, who do you think you have taught, been taught to believe or think you are? Mm -hmm, yeah. Who, who have impressed upon you certain beliefs that you still hold maybe. Correct. About yourself. About yourself. Right. Because the truth is you are enough. You were born enough. Yeah. The rest is an illusion. They're paradigms. They're products of familial generational programming. Right. You know, right. everything, every human being, whether you're a quadriplegic or you're a triathlete, you're worthy. And not because you're quadriplegic or a triathlete, just because you are. You're worthy. Right. So that's who you are. You're worthy. <laughs> I am. Yeah, these are the most important things to absorb, to not absorb, but to, to understand and feel and uh, process. And this is how you grow. It's only because you're worthy. I think you can't, gr I think it's very difficult to grow if you, if your subconscious mind, if you're unconscious or you, you, you live a subconscious life thinking that you're conscious and you're right. as conscious as you think you are if you're not questioning your level of consciousness. Right, right, right. right. So I only know that I am conscious because I'm willing to investigate how conscious I really am. Right. So if I'm not questioning my level of consciousness, then I'm, I presume I'm not conscious or I would presume someone is not conscious. And so, you know, um, it's very, very important that people recognize that the mind is dualistic. It's both subconscious and conscious at the right. same time. Yeah. And consciousness is very minimal. It's about 5% of what's really going on. The brain processes trillions of bits of data per second. We are only consciously aware or can consciously become aware of about 50 bits of data. The temp temperature of the room, the sound of the car outside, the light coming through, through, through my door, door, the way that I feel in my chair, the temperature of the plastic of my chair, what I see in my field of vision, my bird moving, the sound of my dog. 95% of what's happening in my mind is subconscious. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, bodily functions, the functions of my body. Yeah, right. 95% unconscious. But people and ego, the combination of unconsciousness with ego has you believing you are a hundred percent conscious. Yeah, yeah, right. That's that's the illusion of the ego that right. you are a hundred percent conscious of all things. And you're always right. And you're always right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you're always right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's the um, the general approach of a lot of philosophers that you can own all the thoughts that come through your brain and, and, and mind and, and, um, and that the unconscious nah, doesn't have to be addressed. It's, it's, I, it's beyond. So why, why even why? talk about it? Well, that's what, that's why I think, you know, on our first meeting, I said to you, I think the problem with a lot of philosophers is that they study other philosophers, but they never study themselves. That's right. They don't. And it's like, it's like living in a, in a mansion, but choosing to live in one bedroom. There are so many other rooms to explore. And so if you're not exploring the, what's in the subconscious mind, you're living in a mansion tucked in the, a room somewhere. You're not exploring who you really are, mm -hmm. why you are the way you are. And this is, you know, um, I, I pull from, you know, the work of Carl Jung. You know, until man makes that which is unconscious conscious, it will dictate his life and he will call that fate. Right. You know, so Carl, you, you also talked about generational trauma, that you can have trauma be passed down through generations, like with Holocaust survivors. You know, this can be passed down, right? Um, and exploring that, you know, wow, it didn't start with me. You know, like there's some genetics going on here or some trauma that's been instilled in my genes that no wonder I feel this way. Right. 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 
What do you think of institutional trauma? Do you, how I know in, in in the book you 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 know you you certainly you know you write that that um, um, the way in which things are merchandised and advertised and uh, sold. I mean, it creates a, 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 an atmosphere of constant control that, you know, you're actually, they're trying to control us by making us m not measure up to all the wonderful things that they promote. And the culture, it seems to me, has a lot of that often. Uh, I mean, it's the kind of Hollywood, beautiful picture of all things. Um, and it seems to me that we have to sort of punch that uh, phoniness of the culture. Yeah, I think, we, I think we have to understand that, you know, um, that societies have been controlled since the beginning of time through fear. Right. Right. And so if it's really a manipulation of fear, survival fear. I'm not good right. at abandonment, right. not measuring sex, right? right? right. So, um, and so when we think about societies um, and the way that our societies have been, have been, have evolved, it's through fear. And in this day and age, it's we, what do we want? We want commerce. So the people at the top, who need to see you as a busy worker bee have to figure out how to keep you a busy worker bee and mm. keep you contributing mm. to the money wheel. Correct. And so, you know, Revlon, Maybelline, Camel cigarettes, Marlboro cigarettes, you know, um, they actually employ psychologists to help them understand the fears of a human being. Right. Those fears are exploited. Right. And so with makeup commercials, so make women afraid to be old. Mm. So they exploit the word young. Right. They exploit the word young. Correct. They, because the fear is, they understand that the fear is aging. There should be no fear of aging because it's natural. Right. right. But we can't control older women and younger women and we can't control their pocketbooks and what they spend on yeah, right, unless right. we can control their fear of getting older. So let's create products that, that exploit staying younger. Right. So the, you're exploiting that idea, uh, which is creating fear around not having that product. Right, right. You know, the other thing that they can also, they also do is that, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it might've been Camel cigarettes, um, and uh, what they did was, I believe it was the end of World War I, and they wanted women to smart, start smoking cigarettes. Right. And so what they did was they had these women dress in military cute little dresses, and they had the garter belts on, and they put a pack of cigarettes, camel cigarettes, inside the garter belt. And at one point in the parade, they had these beautiful women expose their leg sex. If you're sex, right. you smoke. Right. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. So, and it's if you're strong and you're a woman, you smoke. So they exploited the desire to be of narcissism, right? Right. They exploited narcissism to be good or to be one of the best. So um, they they know what they're doing. When I say they, you know, people who are in positions of power, that um, they're main agenda is to when they're not all companies like that certainly becoming more and more socially conscious um but i think that there definitely is the paradigm is to exploit people's needs and their fears and to monopolize on monopolize on them and to how you do that is to make them feel like they're less than or make them feel like they they can be better than <laughs> so right it's definitely part of the consumerism society that there is um, a constant measuring up to a certain standard of of um of the of an image of an image that they control that they control they control right um in education though um what they can only control is is not so much 
the desire of some individuals to learn and to discover, but they prevent as much as they can the free thinking people, young people too, who, who just want to enjoy and discover by, by putting very boring, um, very boring um, um, standards on, on, on what it is to learn. And in fact, also preventing uh, some parents from, um, well, doing two things, you know, not offering as, as much as, the, as could be done public schooling through charter schools, which would be certain things that certain ch children would want to do. That's number one. And also parents sometimes want, or the children want to not, don't want to go to public schools for the instruction. They would want the interaction, yes, but not the instruction. And, and so that means homeschooling should be an option, but it's becoming harder and harder to homeschool um, your kids, even when the kids want to be homeschooled. Yeah, I think it's, um, it, it, you know, uh, if I'm not mistaken, kindergarten was created in the hopes of creating factory workers. Is that not true? Yes, yes. So if you right. think about it, the whole, the whole premise of kindergarten and, and, you know, controlling, you know, what children learn and, you know, is to create this, these people who, little people that end up in factories, right? That just follow, right. follow along. Yes, it, 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 is, um, it is a line. It is, there's definitely a line to the factory there, yes. Yeah, it's and different. so I think that I understand, I, I, there's definitely room for tremendous improvement. I understand that culturally, there should be some thread of understanding in terms of philosophy and mathematics and whatever social sciences there should, should be but within that within teaching factual things there should always be the ability for to to afford a child the opportunity to be a free thinker right so tell me what you think because teaching a child to memorize is not fucking learning no exactly right it's memorizing right so i am learning through my own sense of curiosity Right. I want to know why that happened when I'm inquisitive, when I'm, when a teacher is, which I think you're fabulous at, when someone makes me, oh, I want to know more about that, you mm -hmm. know, and they're part of the learning process. They're actually learning, right? That's a beautiful thing. Um, and I think children have to be, they have to be encouraged to be curious. And that's why sometimes I feel like, especially testing, we're not testing children, we're te testing teachers in the younger grades. Really, yes. We're, we're testing you, but you know who gets the grade? The, te the student, the teacher the should get the grade, not yes. the student. Because if I have a group of little th uh, third graders and they do great on this test, right? That means that I've been attuned to these children and I've done a phenomenal job as a teacher, right? To encourage them to learn. I've met them where they are and there's been learning that's been done. Right, so the teacher deserves a grade, in my opinion. Um, and then, and then it's not even a bad thing. It's like, okay, how can we? If this, if teacher A, seventy-five percent of her kids did great, right? Teacher B, twenty percent. There's a problem in that classroom. It can't be all the kids. Most likely, it's the teaching, right? Mm -hmm. So let's support the teacher. Let's help the teacher learn what it is to teach. But teaching right. little, I remember being terrified of failing, failing a test. So now I'm afraid, I have all this performance anxiety over taking the test, you're grading me. As I got older, I was like, this isn't about me, it's about you. <laughs> like, you know? Um, and so, I mean, in, in the younger grades, even my children, it was terrifying, you know? I think at a college level, students are responsible for themselves. And how, are, how is a professor to know that because the children are so much part of the, the learning process, how are you to know that the children are, or the children or the adults really are participating um, as much as they are responsible for or could be? You don't know. So making sure they're paying attention, I think is very important. Um, but I think indoctrinating children 
first grade, second grade, third grade, all this stress, no bueno, no good. No, I agree. To make teaching exciting, you have to, I think, uh, open up the, the field. In other words, the, the, the things that are, um, you know, the leading things in the field must be made interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, in my view, the Greek world, the Roman world, the Anglo-American world, the, the world of, of the queens of England, you know, that could be made. I mean, it's, it's a combination of um, assertiveness, freedom, and trauma, really both. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it must be explained as such. And there is no grand narrative. I mean, there are plenty of interesting narratives, um, uh, and 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 you cannot test. You can just you can just say, okay, you know, tell me about Elizabeth the first, or tell me about uh, this person or that person. Um, but but it has to open up to it has to open up to the students' curiosity. If if the teacher is not willing or able, I guess, to tap into the student's curiosity then the student will not learn. You know, you cannot go beyond the fact that they have to be curious about their own world. So that's why I think ultimately the teacher has to talk about certain things that are, you know, sort of the agreement between mm -hmm. a cohort of students and, and the teacher via the college. But I think it has to evolve into a relationship between the, you know, a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the student and, and the teacher or professor. Yeah, I think that's amazing that, that, that you are that way. It's incredible, you know, so. But, but, but the difficulty is, unfortunately, that a lot of students just have never almost had uh, teachers or very few, very few, but it's not impossible, who, teachers who, knew the content well enough and who also cared to sort of get the students to interact with the content, with the stories, with the arguments, with, you know, all these things that the teachers know are valuable. It's, it's, you know, it's like you have, you know, um, parents who feed their children and take them right. to the doctor and put them to bed, give them a bath and put them to bed. Perfectly fine. Right? Yeah. No. And then you have parents who get on the floor and play with their children. Right. And read them stories and act out those stories, right? And right. ask them questions and engage them at dinner time, right? And are interested in their lives. Completely different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's the same thing, you know, um, in, in any, I can have a doctor, go to a doctor and say, okay, your temperature, blood, your blood pressure, your weight, but. Then I can have a doctor go, so tell me about how you're doing. What's the stress level like in your life? You know, how are you eating? Complete, both doing the same job. Right. To me, what, what it comes down to is the one thing that every, we have to, in my opinion, if we want to reach people, we have to get them at the heart level. It has to be an emotional mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to hit them. That's, emotionally. It's, yeah. a, it's a universal experience. Right. Emotions are a universal thing. I can look at a picture of a mom holding a daughter in Syria and I know exactly what she's feeling. Yeah. It's just a picture, right? Um, I'm sorry, pictures are so important. They're worth a thousand words. So I think that the difference is um, heart level, mm -hmm. right? So I can parent and never go into my heart level. I can parent and just do everything I'm supposed to do, which is like my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. Or I can... I can parent with a more open mind, a more conscious mind, and certainly a more open heart. Yeah. And I think that's whether you're a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. or a teacher, it doesn't matter. A lover, you know, yeah, yeah, a friend. Yeah. You know, if I'm willing to meet you at a heart level and, and be curious about you, that because people always remember, that's the way the brain works. So if it's interesting and I feel seen, I'm going to remember that. If it's right. not interesting, it's boring, it's going to be really difficult for my brain to remember that. That's not my fault. You add trauma, dissociation, 
-hmm. fear of making a mistake, the fear of raising my hand, the fear of making, uh, you know, asking a question, the fear of being seen, the fear of being invisible. You add all of that to that experience, it's, it's very difficult for mm -hmm. um, students to like come out of their shell. So it has to be whoever the leader is in the situation or the authority, um, we have to meet them where, where they are. In where my they are. Right, you have to meet them where they are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's why I ask a lot of students to, yeah, I mean, I want, I, told, I tell them, you can never learn ultimately unless you engage with the topic personally you are willing to mm -hmm. be curious about it and and then the teacher gives you an assignment but the assignment ultimately has to reflect your curiosity and your willingness to go into it and in the end you have to have one-on-one -on -one with the teacher there's no yeah. other way this you know i know that uh, whenever a student has a pro whenever a student can improve on something to make to make their paper uh, vibrate, because you know it's obviously in those terms that you can you can describe it. Um, you, ha the teacher has to engage with the student. Sometimes you know it, it does happen that student and maybe some of these students are are online right now. But when a student has some difficulty with something, and you you the teacher tell them, okay, let's do one-on-one -on -one and and discuss it inevitably within five minutes inevitably they start understanding the, the, the whole thing it's like the whole thing sort of makes sense and they like it obviously you know it makes sense in a classroom setting it's a bit harder yeah. to, to do the same thing because they're kind of hiding behind the herd yeah so there is this herd mentality uh, which I I know exists, okay? Because yeah. I've been I've been in the herd, sort of hiding behind the herd. Sure. I was still thinking thoughts on my own, but I was afraid of the herd uh, shouting me out or you know ignoring me, or even even the articulation of the thoughts I had was difficult because the herd was in between yeah. me and the and, and and the guy who or the woman who might have had. An interesting conversation with me. So, if I got rid of the herd, <laughs> being very Nietzschean here, um, you know, if I got rid of the herd, I could communicate one on one with the with the teacher, just like Socrates was doing with his students. You know, he was like, "Let's let let me interact you and me on on a one on one. You know, tell me what it is that matters to you, and and, and then I'll ask you specific questions that will be targeted at you." Mm -hmm. which will show you I actually care and you will learn something from that. I, yeah. That's, that's the, the difficulty of teaching, I think, is, is this, that you have two things. You have the content that you know is, is really worthy of, of, of talking about. And then you have students who are like hiding behind the herd. Uh, do, do, does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And it's also not only that, but there's so many pressures. You know, I got, I'm, I'm working two jobs. I have a couple right. of kids. I got to pay my bills. My parents had a big fight. They're getting a divorce. You know, I might be right. evicted. You know, right. like, you know, there's so many pressures, external right. pressures. Right. right. So it's not just the, the, the teacher and the child. Right. It's what's going on in this person's life, right? right. And yeah. now just because I'm a student and I'm in your classroom, doesn't mean that I'm able to be completely 100% present. That's right. That doesn't mean that you're failing. It doesn't mean that I'm failing. It just means right. that there's a lot of shit. Yeah, going yeah, on. a lot of, a lot of, yeah, absolutely. A lot true. of shit going on. So, but um, I think that the difference between um, a lot, the, I think that the, 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 the difference is the caring, which is intangible, right? You can't touch it, but the child mm -hmm. feels it no matter who you are you know it's like right. you see, again we go back to that you see me and you care yeah yeah i had a man in my coaching program that left a message on our facebook page and he he just he sounded desperate and so i got on facebook and i dialed him up you know wow. and i told him and he was his weeping he was hysterical crying you know he's like i'm in so much pain i said i'm just gonna sit on the phone with you until you start to feel better I, yes. It was about a two hour conversation, wow. you know, and he eventually calmed down and he said to me, 
no one has ever yeah in time yeah. my feelings have always frightened and scared people i said i'm not afraid of your feelings they're just feelings and i don't take right. them personally and i want you to calm down enough so that you can see that your feelings are just feelings they're just indicators telling you where you are right now but you are not your feelings right. you have the ability to observe your feelings and to make a decision from a more lo logical and rational plane but you're not there right now. Your consciousness has been whoop, pulled into the amygdala. And mm -hmm. I'm just gonna stay up here. Right. And I'm gonna represent your higher mind until you can walk out of the subconscious mind, right? Out of the amygdala, you know, out of the hippocampus, non-reactive, and meet me where I am, and then we'll have a conversation about how you feel. But the ingredient wasn't even what I said, it was the fact that I cared. Right, no, exactly, exactly. So, you know um exactly yeah. and, and but but you yeah i mean you cared but you in your caring you you also convey the sense that there are feelings that are okay you're not denying repressing or anything you're saying let them let them be there maybe they'll flush out and and the only way it's going to happen in your they're not going to be uh in your you know in your breast sort of choking you okay right. is when you observe them so you you're talking about the, the the ability of the mind to to look and let it flush out i mean these are metaphors of the body and the mind that are incredibly valuable and they relate they they essentially are the same as the experiences of the people who were writing in the time of aristotle and and the stoics and even the christians who were saying look allow for these bad things that have happened that you also caused to happen because of whatever you know sin whatever it is flush it let it acknowledge it flush it out love be be willing to be part of love um and and in in that capacity what you're i mean in that sense what you're saying validates and extends further you know these great aspects of our tradition which unfortunately have become kind of dead academic and and, and meaningless to a lot of people see i think you know, my son my son's an atheist and he says to me you know um mom i don't and i agree with him he said i don't have to believe in something to be a good person correct that's true I will, I choose to be good because I believe in treating people the way I want to be treated. So I don't have to be afraid of something to be good. And I think that's awesome. You know, he has his own moral compass, you know, and he's going to be good. He's not going to inflict harm or damage or any, to anyone intentionally. And if it unintentionally, that's a different story because you can unintentionally say something to me. I could be highly sensitive to it and feel offended. And you didn't mean to intentionally harm me that's not your fault. There's something in me, right? That right, may have, right. What's up with that? You know, but in terms of what I think what we're talking about is we have to recognize, I, and I think a big piece of the puzzle that might be missing is that, is that the brain works a certain way automatically. And so when we talk about sin, it's almost like Christians feel like they did something wrong. You did nothing wrong. You are, your brain is both conscious and unconscious at the same time. If your parents taught you that you were bad or they made you feel bad and they shamed you, you don't feel good enough. You are going to engage in behaviors that reinforce this idea that you're not good enough. You're gonna hear it in the back of your mind. I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough. You get into a relationship, you're not gonna feel good enough. You might feel needy, you might be codependent, you might, not, you might cling, you might push someone away, right? right? You might be aggressive. Are these sins or are they just products of an unconscious mind? The problem I think is that lots of us, when we say, oh, I've sinned, we assume responsibility for our unconsciousness and we can't. We assume responsibility and thus we assume blame. We can't. The brain works a certain way. And we have to understand that in our unconsciousness, we are going to, I, I talk about in quantum tools and I talk about, and I know it makes people very uncomfortable, but I use the analogy because I wanted to drive home a point. If I was sexually abused, if I'm a man and I was sexually abused from the time I was two to 12, mm -hmm. it's unresolved. 
Right, right. No, I, at, I know what you're saying. At 17, I have a great compulsion narrative in my head to abuse or to have sexual contact with a child. Is that my fault? No, I agree with you. Yes, you've been programmed in the bad way, wrong way. And it's a matter of programming this poor child at two, right? But what we've got to understand is that this abuse will perpetuate because of the way the world right. unfolds. Right. It is unconscious. Right. The, the way I, I construe sin is that some hurt or bad or evil was done to somebody um, in, in such a way that, that um, as, as a result of me, you know, interacting or doing it, uh, you know, so, some more damage has been caused upon, upon the world. Um, I, I, I don't take it literally as a sort of original sin, but in terms rather of more evil that did not need to happen, happened. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I agree with your ge ge genealogy of it all. I agree with that. I, I, was, I, I, I still think that um, the, the harm that is caused upon the world because we don't, you know, we don't understand what's going on or because others are doing things that are objectively that we've allowed them to do objectively bad, that are objectively bad, that is what forces us to talk about ethics mm -hmm. because bad stuff will happen. Yeah. And I think it's helpful to sort of not, sugar, not, not only sugarcoat it, sugar it, but it's, it's important to say what they did was bad or was evil, yes. has caused evil. Yes has caused trauma, is continuing on to do, to, to, to do that. This is how I see sin per se. I'm, I'm not saying it's original sin that, is in, that makes me flawed from the right. get-go. No, it's, it's just right. that there is evil perpetrated somehow, unfortunately, right now by people who cheat and lie. Yeah, for her and, children. Right, 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 right. And, and, but, but see, the expression of that Number one, maybe it's flawed, somewhat flawed, in, in even some of the great Christian thinkers. Um, but, but ultimately, they want to overcome it. They want, they want a life beyond this weight. Uh, professor? Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off, but I actually just wanted to add, um, and, you know, Lisa, um, Lisa was talking about her son being an atheist, but at the same time, he says that he doesn't have to believe in anything to do, you know, good things. Um, so I've been watching a couple of the, you know, atheist versus Christian debates online. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you guys heard of uh, William Lane Craig and, um, but he's like an apologist and the Christian point of view, they say that if you're an atheist, your objective morals, in other words, um, what's right and what's wrong is it's you you can't account for it like christians the right and wrong is grounded with god and the bible so they can say hey this you know rape is wrong because it says it in the bible right. but for an atheist they can't account for what's right and what's wrong um you know i don't know if you guys agree with that or not but they're saying that in other words your beliefs that you have as being a good person is really borrowed from the Christian worldview. Yeah, that's sad because what you're saying is that I can't have my own self-identity. You're saying that I can't, of my own free mind, decide <clears throat> what is good for me and what is bad for me. It has to be tied to, um, you know, something outside of me. And I think that's really sad because I, I don't believe that that's the case. Yeah. No, I agree with that. No, that's not what I'm saying. Well, what I'm saying is the Christians, that's their worldview. And is, that's what their, that's what their belief is, is that, wow. hey, you know, everything that you do, even though you don't believe in God, it's like, it's actually borrowed from our worldview, you know, so. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, and again, I think it's, it's, uh, 
when you stand back and, you know, my question is why would any Christian need to say that anyway, you know? Um, and uh, so, you know, what is God, you know, and if there is a God, who says God is Christian? You know, it's, it just, it, it's, a, it's so sticky and it's, it gets very, very messy, you know, because, and people, I always say this, language is very important because I might have an association of who and what I think God is. It doesn't mean that that matches your association with who and what God is. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's interesting that, that the Christian view is, oh, if you're a good person, it's because you're, you're stealing it from us or those ideals from us. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, that that's that. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what they're saying is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, even though you're denying that, you know, your values and everything, your morals and everything, the objective, you know, murder is wrong and all that. It's you have you can't account for how you know what's right and what's wrong in your, you know, being an atheist. Right. But for a Christian, it's like, hey, we we know what's right and wrong. And it's coming from the Bible. You know, it's coming from God. Um, that's their take on it. Um, and sure. it's pretty consistent with the debates, no matter, you know, who is uh, speaking for the Christian side. It's pretty consistent. Yeah. Well, then, then, you know, I, I just want to sort of maybe do a transition here. Um, not, not to avoid the subject at all, but to, to explain to you how I, I, I think I see it. Um, the Christians uh, did not have a real ob objection to the deist, the people who generally believed in, in a God, or like, you know, the Stoics who generally believe there, there's an order to the cosmos. Um, sort of Cicero, who believed in Zeus in a very vague way. Um, did not believe in the specific gods of Rome or, or Socrates, likewise, who did not believe in, in the stories of Zeus and Athena. He didn't believe in that. He knew it was all invented. Um, um, so there is, on the one hand, this general sense, which the Christians accepted is like, why not? I mean, it makes more sense to them than saying it's all material causes and there is no spiritual dimension to the human being. So uh, what is it that the Christians have added to, to the old Stoic way? Well, they've added a narrative. The narrative is, unfortunately, you know, you, you will say taken up, taken over by some uh, probably narcissistic and abusive people who use the dogma, the, the letter of the law, the letter of what is written to abuse or to control people. Now, Paul, St. Paul, kind of said it that way too. Let's not, let's not allow these people to manipulate all, all others through the fact that it's all written out on, in the Bible. So, you know, the New Testament in a way begins by saying, get rid of all this mm -hmm. um, literal stuff that is meaningless, you know, that you're a good Jew because you follow the Bible, you know, like letter, you know, mm -hmm. one letter at a time. And the only thing that matters, therefore, for the Christian is love. Okay, this, this is where, to me, where it boils down to. And, and, you know, I totally agree with Lisa. You have to have these psychological categories of, you know, are you empowered or are you made subservient? Okay. Uh, you must be made empowered because this is the uniqueness of you, your freedom. In a way, it's, got, it's kind of God-given. You didn't give it to yourself, your freedom. You just have to use it right. and enjoy it, right? Right. right. And, and so therefore, anything that rebels against a static dimension of religion is good. Anything that rebels, even when it means being an atheist. Because the atheist says, I've had it. I don't want to hear these stories. Goodbye. Okay. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone. And that is perfectly fine. I think perfectly fine. But the only thing I want to say is that in the Christian tradition to which I relate reluctantly. All right. With you, let me be honest with you, but still generally, um, I would say that the notion faith, faith means that there is something greater than I. Okay. And then, there is a sort of hope that through faith, people will be made better. 
if only they give it a little, a little a bit of a shot, a shot. But the only thing that ultimately connects those two is charity, love, okay? Because if you don't have love, you will never go beyond yourself. And then you will never have a sense that there's something higher than you eat also. So I, I take Christianity not at all like the, the Bible is true and because that's, that's used by these sects and these denominations and all these people. They're, you know, they're full of themselves. It's, it's obvious they verge into a sectarian manipulation of the groups they control, whether it be those crazies that, you know, do their communes or even the Catholic Church. I mean, when I look at the Catholic Church, sometimes I go, oh my God, these, these people are just full of themselves. This is just unbelievably full of themselves. So this is where I, I, I think we can, you know, I will validate the fact that there are truly moral people like your son, Lisa, who is an atheist. And, and I, would, I would say, yes, yes, you know, just, you know, live your, a good life. And that's, that's all that matters. And then I would stay, still say to Koza, look, there are certain good ideas that come out of a certain tradition, but the tradition has to be very much criticized from within because it's inevitable that the Catholic Church will do some crap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I do think it's possible to um, believe in right or wrong. You know, right. we have a set of laws, you right. know, also help give us a frame of reference. You no know, speeding, don't drink and drive. Right, so, right. You know, um, the way our parents treat us within a home and the way, you know, they, yes. our siblings treat. So we're getting, you know, we're getting a good dose of, right or wrong throughout our lifetime. Right, we are, we are. No, because they themselves, our parents, in fact, got it from, right. uh, from outside. You can't go into the neighbor's house or whatever. You know, these things are pretty obvious. Boundaries, right. boundaries. And I think that, you know, and also you're learning from just the way, you know, if you come from a home where there's a lot of self-respect, you're, you're developing a moral code or a moral compass. That's right what you're That's experiencing right. so it doesn't have to be tied to you could never hear the word god and have parents right. treat, treat their neighbors lovingly even if they're not so loving yes right? and you could have parents who are like oh she's just you know she's ornery you know it's okay right and so what does that teach the child not take things so seriously so this moral code is being shaped outside of of any mention of god you know right just and so I think that that's, that's a, I think that's a valid argument, you know, um, and, but I don't know, to me, it, to me at the end of the day, I, I, I would prefer not to even have that argument because I don't see the necessity for it. <laughs> I don't see the necessity of having um, an argument between an atheist and, and, um, you no, know, I agree. You know, I agree. Um, the, the, I, I don't think arguments, you know, in the, in the sort of, back and forth or that because I was talking about is 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 necessarily good um but but i I still think that um, um, you know in a, in a very materialistic society where spirituality can be explored i mean would individuals will benefit from exploring spirituality yeah. then there are various dimensions to spirituality mm -hmm. and 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 the as cogent a presentation of either Christianity or Judaism or, or, or some ideas within Judaism, right? Let's just be, be maybe just because if, if the whole package is kind of warped or uh, has been damaged already, then maybe only something can, can, be, can be loved or can be uh, appreciated. And likewise in Christianity, maybe there's only you know, a few things that, that could be uh, zeroed in and, 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 and factored in and, and appreciated. Um, and, and, and therefore, allow these people to talk. Let's mm -hmm. not prevent them from speaking because, you know, I'm a Jew or I'm a Muslim right. or, you know. Yeah. And I think like a debate about between Christians and atheists and whoever, you know, Muslims and whatever, 
you know, I think, you know, as long as the debate isn't the, the purpose of the debate is to prove one wrong. And right. right. Correct. Correct. That's just not, and if Correct. that's what's going on, I just think that's a tremendous waste of energy. You know? Exactly. No, it is exactly right. Is it? It's exactly right. It's a waste of energy. Because and neither is right and neither is wrong. It's like if this empowers you, all the power to you, and you're not hurting other people. That's an amazing thing. You know, right. keep keep trucking. You know, like it's okay. You know, um, I think we get caught. I think too often we struggle with is my idea the right way? You know, and right. how, can right. I, how can I? Who can I argue against? Right. No. Yeah. Who? Right. Right. That my dad, just if you're an atheist be an atheist and if you're a christian right. be a christian if you're protestant if you're a muslim whatever just be you if that feels comfortable for you but i right. think when people are uncomfortable right and they're not 100 percent comfortable with who they are right. sometimes develop there's this need to like push what they feel and believe is the right way right. down someone's throat because they're not so sure when they're right. not so confident in what they believe is right or moral. Right, right, right. right. My, my suggestion is simply that there is, uh, there are various dimensions to spirituality and, and they can be, you know, being a Buddhist, being, um, you know, any, any, or thinking of the pagan rites of the, uh, you know, the primitive people, why not? Think yeah. about it. You know the Indian, the Amer the Native in Indians. Why not? You know why not take a. a you know why why not give it a little thought. And why not or, respect it? Oh, absolutely, it has to be why respected. Not, why not yeah. accept it right. and respect it? That's good for right. them. You know they took from the earth. If they ate a stalk yeah. of corn, they planted corn again. What's wrong with that? Yes. You know, yes. If, they, if they took something, they gave back. That's a beautiful thing. It's a celebration of you know uh, life. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a, yeah, I think, I think the goal is to really know yourself, know your true self, not who someone taught you to be, know who you are, know what makes, what, what fits right in your skin, what fits right, what moral code fits right for you that might change in a year or two, be willing to change it. Right, right, right. right, right. Because nature is about expansion. So it's just keep expanding. It's totally fine. Yes. Um, I remember in, ter in, you know, in the philosophy class, I've used this book. I've, I've, I've read uh, a few things from it. So I just want to um, just remind, because everyone will, will read it again. Uh, but there's this section on truth seekers. Mm -hmm. And Lisa Romano quotes these uh, great uh, people. Um, and I'm reading from page 68, which in the, in, the, in the new printout will be a different one. But from the end, she uses John Lennon, all you need is love. Einstein, everything, everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole, high, its whole life believing that it is darn stupid. Okay, darn, I just added. Um, but you see, these are important things that Gandhi, okay, always aim at complete harmony of thought and word and deed. Always aim at purifying your thoughts and everything will be well. So Thoreau, Jesus, okay, Jesus, if you bring forth what is within you, what you will bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will, in fact, destroy you. You will not grow. So all these things are, uh, you know, um, ways of growing, ways of um, enriching the, your thoughts with how to become a a, a more productive person, a, a sort of happier person, and I think this is this is the great contributions you've made, Lisa. Thank you to to this class at least, uh, in terms of making us realize that um, you can use psychology, you can use training, you can use your intuition of people, you can use your critical thinking, you can say, you know, like you've said before, uh, the even the psych the psychotherapist prof the professions of the psychotherapist is not up to par uh, in in many ways because they want to impose their standards they're not listening in the not most all of them. not all of them but the, well yeah right not all of them not, not all. all of them but many of my i had one client tell me that she went into marriage counseling and she was so angry and the therapist said you have to leave and i cannot work with you until you come back and you're not so angry 
Yeah. No, it's, it's your job to help her understand why she's angry. Yeah. Or stop being angry that she's angry. Right, 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 right. Exactly. That's and, your and, job. And, and the, that, that just shows the inability of the mind in the psychotherapist to, to allow the anger to be flushed out. Yeah, to help. I don't know. I think if you're a therapist, so often, right? Therapists want to go into therapy because they have their own wounded childhoods. Yes. And they want to help. Um, and so the answer to helping is to not to study other people. The answer is to, to help other people is to study yourself. That's right. Yeah. Once you hey, Lisa. Yep. I actually just before I go, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, sure. I came in a little late, and uh, I caught the part where, you know, you were talking about you know teaching children. I actually have three uh, of my own that I'm actually homeschooling with my wife. Awesome. And, um, you know, it's pretty tough right now, you know, with all the things going on and trying to teach them at home. Sure. But the part where you mentioned, I think the term you used was like free thinking or yeah. have them really think you know, a little bit and not just have them you know, right. memorize answers and things like that. So I wrote some notes down and uh, some notes down about that. And um, I totally agree. So, um, you know, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. Make yeah. them a part of the experience. You right. know, if you're reading a story, make them a character or ask them mm -hmm. what character they want to be, mm -hmm. you know, and ask them what character they want you to be, you know, bring mm -hmm. it to life for them, you know, right. make it a 3D experience and don't, they won't forget it. Because if you, if you understand how the mind works, how the brain learns, is the, the brain doesn't learn by looking and memorizing. The, learn, the brain needs to do, it needs to touch, it needs to taste, it needs to feel, it needs to smell. Um, mm -hmm. So if you, if you activate various parts of the brain, then the memories that are created, they're created in various parts of the brain. And so all of these, the areas of the brain that become activated in the learning begin to layer on top of one another. And it's much easier for that information to become stored in long-term memory. Mm -hmm. So that's why I really think it's important to just make sure that it's as 3D an experience as you can make it. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Kuzal. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Great. Well, so I think we're going to wrap it up. But um, yeah, I, that was an excellent uh, intervention that he raised. Yeah. Sometimes it's always at the end that we get these really okay. interesting questions, but but obviously the learning process in 3D, as you explained it, and just focusing on how to, you know, really interact with a child mm -hmm. is, is, is vital. I think it's absolutely vital. And th that also is stuff that the real philosophers really understood, that mm -hmm. it, the imagination is the key thing. It's not because it combines both logical and, and, and sense data. But it's, it has to sort of, it has to snap. There's gotta be a snappy thing, you know, that, that resonates and you will always learn from the things you love because they, 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 they jiggle your imagination. It's also thoughts and feelings. So if I can, if a feeling right. is everything because right. feeling is associated with memory. Yeah. Right, right, right. But imagination is is the sensation and the feeling and the logical connections. So the narratives, you know, draw on the connections that the brain does, but then they bring them back to feelings and, and sensations. Mm -hmm. So that or you have a feeling, and the feeling actually starts the imagination, right? Yeah, yeah, so, right, right. So, so yeah, it's yeah, a beautiful right. thing. Imagination is everything. This has been great. Thank you so much for well, thank you very much, Lisa. I truly appreciate it. Yeah. I'm just going to give it to the students. Let me just stop the recording right now.